Good morning and uh, welcome to um, Open Access Africa, the third Open Access Africa conference. Um, I usually would start this with a little bit of a, a description of, of open access, but I think the video that you've just seen really says most of it. So um, I just have one slide which describes um, a little bit about what open access is and the difference between the, um, the model that we're all used to with subscription publishing. Um, so open access has no subscription barriers. Um, anyone can access um, open access journals as long as they have um, access to the internet. All you need is a computer and access to the internet. And research is openly licensed for reuse. Um, and as you heard in, in the video, there are various reasons why that is really useful in terms of being able to um, do further research on things that are already discovered. But it doesn't mean that open access journals have any different quality and standards. Um, so open access journals have editors in chief, editorial boards, peer review, indexing, they are just like um, traditional journals in those ways. Um, and they have varying amounts of quality. So as with subscription journals, then there are very, very good open access journals. Um, you'll hear from um, the editor of Malaria Journal later on this morning, an excellent um, and established journal um, and very high in its field. Um, there are some which are not so good just like with subscription journals. So it's nothing to do with the business model, um, how the journal is run. Um, it's about how you can access and reuse the content. So open access started in about the year 2000. Um, Biomed Central um, started in 2000 and was the first open access publisher, although there were open access journals before that, but people generally think that you know, 2000 is a, is a good place to start measuring from. And as you can see from this slide, it's grown very, very fast since then. Um, the yellow line is Biomed Central, and this is the number of articles published per year um, up from 2000 to 2011. And then catching up very fast, Public Library of Science PLOS, um, which was launched uh, a couple of years later, but um, with PLOS One, um, they, have, they have only seven journals, but PLOS One is the biggest journal in the world now. Um, and all of that growth um, in, in the, the recent years is because PLOS One has been growing at an enormous pace. And then Hindawi, which is an Egyptian publisher, um, which had a, a whole range of subscription journals, which they decided... Um, you know, the open access was the future and they turned their subscription journals into open access journals and as you can see there, the green line, they're growing very fast as well. And other, other um, publishers are, are coming up fast, but where, where, however you look at it, open access is growing very, very fast. And it's across all subject areas as well. This is from... Um, an article that was published in one of our journals, BMC Medicine, I'll refer back to this article um, later in my talk, um, which looks at the, it's called The Anatomy of Open Access Publishing, a study of longitudinal development and internal structure. And it shows um, the growth of open access in different fields. And although biomedicine is, is leading the way significantly, um, because it's really where it started, um, you can see that in all areas, it is growing pretty fast. And it's growing across the world. This map shows um, repositories and where the repositories are located. Um, so this is where people can deposit um, their content in institutional repositories where they can make their content available, open access. And they are... They are um, across the world. But also, um, these are a few um, headlines about announcements that have been made. Um, in, you know, and there are only a very, very small number of, of, of announcements here. 
but um, we've, we've seen this year many, many, many announcements of new open access policies from governments, from institutions, from um, multi-governmental groups, from non-governmental organizations. So um, the British government has, has made um, a commitment to um, that the research that they fund will be published open access from next year. The European community has a fund which is, um, or has, has an intention for all of the content that they fund to be published in, in an open access way. Um, and at the bottom you'll see um, the World Bank and the World Bank's open access policy. And we're very delighted to have um, Carlos Rossell from the World Bank to talk to us about that tomorrow. Um, so why publish open access? What, what, what are the advantages? Um, well, obviously, we've heard about the unlimited access to content. Um, but the other things that um, may be not so obvious, um, open access journals are generally electronic only, um, which means that they're not limited in the way that um, previous journals used to be by the size of them. And so they can choose, as PLOS One has, as Biomed Central has in their BMC series, to um, publish inclusively. So that means that rather than saying, we're going to rate this on whether we think it's going to be the most exciting um, paper we've ever seen, they say, is this good science? And if it's good science, we will publish it. Now, we know that in... Um, Africa and various other countries that have had, had problems with um, getting their papers published in established journals because of these, these page budgets and because people have been limiting what they accept. Now that's not true anymore in, um, in these inclusive journals because it's possible to accept anything which is good science and so that's um, one of the advantages, especially in the developing world where, where, play, where scientists have had problems getting their, their papers published. Um, it's possible when something's open access to make it much more visible to anyone who wants to see it. And I'll talk a little bit about how that works um, a little later on. And as we heard, um, the reuse and the ability to data mine are very, very important. But also we can publish as much as, you know, there's no limits on size, but also we can publish associated data sets, we can publish videos, we can publish additional files. So the content isn't limited by um, how, the, how the journal looks in terms of format. Now that's not necessarily only an open access thing, but being able to link out and link back is very important. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so here's, here's a little bit about visibility. Um, this is, um, I don't, downloaded this yesterday. It's the uh, most accessed articles from the Biomed Central website um, over the last 30 days. So this is the number of accesses um, over the last 30 days for these articles. And the one thing I wanted to point out to you here was that three of those articles have been published in the last two or three weeks. So the top one, or the, the second to the top, has had 12,381 accesses and was published on the 16th of October. Um, the, the one underneath that has had 8,136 accesses and was published on the 30th of October. So um, not very long ago at all. And the one at the bottom is the one that I, I showed you the the graph out of, published on the 22nd of October, The Anatomy of Open Access Publishing, it's had 7,000 accesses. So people, um, if, if, if something's open access, it can have very, very large numbers of accesses. It can be seen by a lot of people. Um, and why does that happen? Well, um, this again refers to the um, open access, the journal about um, the longitudinal study of, of open access. Um, it was published at the beginning of open access week, which was um, the week before last. And um, 
because of that, it, it got very involved in the, in the Twitter and the um, other sort of um, social media um, interest that was going on around Open Access Week. Um, and if you look at the top left-hand corner of this slide, that is the altmetrics score of this journal. Altmetrics is short for alternative metrics, and it measures what's going on in social media around an article. Um, and it looks at how many Twitter, how many um, Facebook, how many blogs um, have been around this article. And an altmetric score of 193 in two weeks is very, very high. Um, and the other thing that happened around this article was that um, BMC Medicine, the journal, published um, and organized what's called a tweet chat where for two hours last Friday, I think a week ago, um, they had a set of questions they wanted to answer and they had everybody start to talk in, um, on Twitter about this article. And um, on, the, on the right hand side, that's um, what's called a storify of that discussion where various people got involved and started to discuss a set of five questions that they had around this article. So, you know, here are some of the things that can happen. Um, this is a, a recent um, blog by um, an, an author called Dr. Bartolon Mesko from Hungary. And he has published this on something called Open Access Success Stories. Um, and he talks about an article that he wrote, in fact, in a Biomed Central journal, but I would have used this even if it hadn't been a Biomed Central journal, um, where he talked about his first paper that he published, um, I think, two or three years ago. And what he, he describes is the fact that scientists who work in the same field as him found um, him and his co-authors much more easily through reading this open access publisher, and that because of this, they have been able to start new collaborations with people who they didn't know, who they wouldn't have found out about. And I think that is a really important um, thing for researchers and open access, is that new collaborations are made, new relationships are made between um, researchers who may not have actually been able to do that before if their article had been locked up in a journal that other people wouldn't have seen. Um, and so, as he says, publishing in an open access journal can provide enormous opportunities, especially if you use the, the social media opportunities. So, but there is a cost, as again, as, as was mentioned in the video, um, the cost of publishing doesn't go away just because it's made open access. So um, publishers do various things. They manage peer review. They don't do the peer review. Obviously, academia does the peer review, but there's a lot of work around managing peer review, about um, keeping the systems up to date, developing and keeping the systems up to date, and, and making um, sure that the, the articles are, are being distributed appropriately. Um, formatting a markup of articles, in working with the indexing services, and marketing, making sure that readers and authors and everybody know about the journal. Um, so how are those costs covered? Well, there was a survey um, a few years ago, um, a couple of years ago, called the SOAP study, study on open access publishing, which, survey, which did uh, two things. It looked at the market from data that existed, and then it also surveyed a lot of, um, of, of researchers, 40,000 researchers. Um, the data is, is all at that website there, and it's very interesting. It has a lot of interesting data about open access in various different, um, looking across all subjects, looking across all countries. Um, but one of the things it, it looked at is what are the income um, sources for the journals that um, publish open access. And what it found was that the large publishers um, would be charging some, which is, is what Biomed Central does, would be charging something called an article processing charge, an APC, and that's the majority of ways 
that they um, they they receive income for um, to cover their costs. Um, they also have memberships. They also um, have advertising. Whereas the smaller journals um, tend to do more in terms of sponsorship, subscriptions, um, and those sorts of things. Very much less an APC. And this is an interesting point because African journals. Um, often need to have subscriptions at the moment to cover their costs because it's difficult to charge African researchers for article processing charges. And that means that African journals are, are, are limited in turning into open access because um, they need to find a way to keep themselves, um, cover their costs in a way which doesn't make them have to um, stop people accessing their content. And this is something that's very much a discussion that's, that's going on at the moment, will continue to go on at the moment. Um, but having said that, um, the big publishers, Biomedcentral, um, PLOS, um, and, and various others, do give waivers to those, um, those people who can't afford to pay. And so Biomed Central gives an automatic waiver to all low and middle income countries that have a GDP of less than $200 billion, um, which means that very nearly all of the um, countries in Africa are covered by a waiver scheme, which means that if you come from one of those countries, you don't have to pay an article processing charge. Um, and that's very important to us. More than 5% of our articles are being published under that scheme. African um, authors are becoming a bigger proportion of what we publish, so, so that scheme's getting bigger at the moment. Um, so just a little bit about Biomed Central. We started in 2000, and I said we published 244 journals. Um, we have published over 130,000 articles, which are all available um, open access through a Creative Commons license. We have about 10 million downloads every month, and um, the way we do cover our um, costs is via um, the APC. Um, we also host um, a portfolio of journals which was started by our parent company, Springer, which is called Springer Open, um, whereas Biomed Central publishes in the biomedical fields, Springer Open are the open access journals in the other fields like economics, humanities, physics, um, those things that aren't biomedical. And there are now 101 journals in Springer Open. So recent developments. Um, we have recently um, launched, um, it's open for submissions, a video journal which um, is, is based on videos with text accompanying rather than the other way around. Um, it's a medical journal. It's about endoscopic surgery. Um, we're very excited about that. It's a different way of publishing. Um, we hope we're one of those creative publishers that they were talking about in the video that's going to be um, doing exciting things. It's continuing to do exciting things. We've also recently made our journals much more um, compatible with mobile so that if you access our journals through your mobile, you'll be able to travel around them and read things much more easily. Um, and I'm certainly finding that much more, much more easy to look at our journals. And um, coming soon um, is something called Cases Database. Any of you who were Open Access Africa last year will have heard Joseph Anna talking about the importance of medical case reports for giving us information about um, conditions and we have a lot of um, case reports in our journals and this is a free database which we're going to launch in the next couple of months where it gives you a view of case reports that are within Biomed Central Journals but we've also got a number of other publishers who are joining in so you'll be able to search by um, condition, by age, by gender and, and look at um, you know, is, is there a case report on this type of condition with this type of symptom with this type of person? And we're very excited about that. So a little bit about Biomed Central Africa. I've talked to you about the waiver fund. 
Um, I will talk to you a little bit about our foundation membership, about um, our open access and developing world um, website, about Open Access Africa, which is where we are, and our sum summit on the sustainability of open access in Africa. But I'd also like to um, say that we have a number of journals which are very focused on African research, and we have a few postcards which will be on the registration table um, and, and a leaflet um, which gives you some information about those um, journals, and, I, and that leaflet is in you. The postcards are on the registration table, but the leaflet in your bag shows you the journals which are really focused on African research. Um, and we are very happy that um, submissions and publications from Africa in our journals are increasing very rapidly. So um, this is just the last five years. As you can see, in 2007, we have very few submissions and hardly any publications from Africa. Um, and this year, we are expecting that, you know, based on current figures, we're expecting that we'll have over 3,500 submissions and well over probably 1,700 publications from where at least one of the authors is based in, in Africa. So we're very pleased that, that we are getting more and more research, able to publish more and more research from African countries. So foundation membership. Um, Biomed Central has memberships where um, in countries where APCs are paid, it allows their authors to have either their APCs paid by the institution or discounted by the institution. Obviously, in waiver countries, that's not relevant um, because there is no APC to be paid. But what we have as foundation membership is um, a way of an institution showing support for open access. And you'll be hearing um, from Helena Asmoa Hassan um, later on about um, her institution, and they were one of our first foundation members. Um, it allows institutions who are committed to open access, so who have signed some, some sort of, um, who has an open access policy in place, and who have been publishing in, open, in our open access journals, um, to show their commitment and to he we help them um, make open access visible throughout the institution. So we give them a Biomed Central web page. Um, we work with the institution providing open access promotional material and reports on their um, publications. Um, we give them a, a member logo and badge to show on their own website, and we help them with promotion of membership. And um, as I said, that's... Um, <laughs> Here is an example, again, um, this is um, from the, the institution we'll be hearing from later, the Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. Um, this is their, their page for their foundation membership. Um, Open Access and Developing World is a website that we have brought together um, interesting and relevant content um, about the developing world, about content that we're publishing. Um, news, and um, you'll see advertised at the top of that a journal we launched this week. We're very pleased with is a, a WHO-related journal, Infectious Diseases of Poverty. Um, highly recommend you have a look at that journal. We've got postcards on the um, on the table outside. Um, Open Access Africa, here we are, and um, it's one, one of our activities that we're, we're very, very proud of. Started in Kenya, um, in Ghana last year, and here we are in South Africa. Some nice pictures on the bottom. Um, but the outcomes that we've had so far, um, last year we heard about Sudan's first institutional repository um, was a direct... Um, uh, outcome of the first Open Access Africa conference where people met and they, cre they, they created a project, um, and that was very exciting. Um, last year, new open access groups were formed in Nigeria and Ghana, and we're very pleased that we've got some of the, the people from those groups here today. And um, the Summit on Sustainability of Open Access in Africa 
um, was um, one, of the, one of the key things that came out of last year where the issue of how African journals can be sustainable um, was something that came very strongly out of last year. So we brought together with Wellcome Trust um, all of these agencies to talk about the problem. And we're beginning to, to bring together um, some ideas about how to move forward. Um, the um, outcomes of that summit was um, that we, we need to get commitment to open access from the funders and institution. We need, we, or we, we know that there is commitment. We want to enable the funds to be used to make research open access when they're funding African research. So how can we make that happen? Um, how do we improve the reputation of open access? We know that there's some misinformation. We know that some people just don't understand about open access. Um, so how can we make sure um, that people understand that prestigious research is being published in open access journals? How can we make sure that people who do believe in it have the means to communicate well on open access? Um, how do we show why it's valuable? And um, how do we get the influencers in, in African countries to, um, to buy in to the whole idea of open access? We talked about capacity building and looked at, at how we help with capacity building, both in research and also um, in publishing. And um, we will be having a follow-up meeting tomorrow with people who were at the, at the summit last year and a few extra people, um, or sorry, last summer, so that we can um, move things forward and hope to have some, some real you know, tangible outcomes quite soon. So based, this, this program was really based on that discussion and so you'll see that the um, sessions this afternoon is on capacity building, tomorrow is on open access advocacy and tomorrow afternoon sustainability of open access. Those were based on the themes that came out of the summit and we really believe we've got a great program together. As um, Ruth said, if you tweet, do tweet on the, on the Open Access Africa hashtag um, that's up there. And um, I hope you really enjoy the next two days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Jamie Finnecker, Budley Managing Editor of the South African Medical Journal. Just a comment. Um, uh, the notion of being able to publish much more and, and freely is, uh, uh, in my mind, not quite correct because oh, one still has to process that material that's very long in terms of things like uh, copy editing and so on. So there is a cost in publishing uh, more material, whether it's online or uh, in print. That's true. Um, with open access being funded by article processing charges, that means that every article that gets published, if, it's, um, if it has an, open, uh, an article processing charge paid, then that's scalable, because if you get a, publish 100 articles, you have 100 APCs. If you publish 200 articles, you have 200 APCs. However, it is a problem in, in a country where people can't pay APCs. So that's part of our discussion about how to make open access sustainable. Um, so it's a very good point. Um, it's very scalable with, with APCs and not so scalable when it's, when it's not funded by APCs. I'm Leslie Lander from the School of Public Health and Government in the NQTT. Um, part of the, the criteria for academic promotion in most constituencies is uh, citations to the impact of your, your articles and uh, open access has the high access level to it, which strangely enough, the editors of the journal are asked, can I make a huge plan as a BAT journal? They didn't really understand how it was computed, so I wonder if you could just comment on that and what sort of value it could contribute to you in know, an academic uh, in developing countries 
also have impact factors for um, well over half of our journals at the moment. Um, one of the, and, and, and that's one of the um, usual ways that people um, look at those. Open access journals, because most of the open access journals that exist are less than, 10, less than 12 years old, and many of them are less than five or six years old, many of them don't have open, uh, impact factors yet. Um, because it takes a while to get into the, um, the, the Thompson um, Journal Citation Index. So um, th these other metrics are not um, necessarily um, the, you know, the, 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 we are all looking at alternative metrics and ways in which we can, can manage those things. And it's not obvious <laughs> yet how those things can help in terms of funders, but we have a number of funders here, and it may be interesting for um, if, if one of those people might be interested in um, commenting on whether they are looking at alternative metrics as ways of, of, of measuring um, research. Can I just a quick comment on the uh, highly accessed logo? And, um, obviously, Matt from Wireless Central. Um, if you click on the logo, it'll tell you, it gives you an explanation of um, what it indicates. And roughly speaking, it means it's in the top 5 to 10% of articles of a similar um, age in terms of how long it's been since it's published, and also <coughs> relative to the typical access level for the journal that's in. Because one of the challenges is that a very obscure journal for a sort of organic chemistry will get maybe 20 fold less access on average than a very kind of generally interesting public health title, which um, gets a lot of coverage in the press. Um, so it's sort of a, a normalized picture, for both on age and on average access level. And it's just one of the many types of um, alternative metrics which we are developing. Uh, I have a, I don't know if it is a question or suggestion or comment. There are a lot of information out there, especially in terms of uh, African traditional medicine. Unfortunately, most African traditional uh, medicine people who have got the medical knowledge are not illiterate. And they don't have the ability to write and get the information accessible and publish in the journals as we have. What can we do? to access that information from the traditional African medical practitioners who are not literate, so that we can get that information properly documented and made accessible. Uh, I'm just giving an example. I am from a country, original country. I've settled in South Africa for some time now. And in my, I'm an Asante boy from Kumasi. Traditionally, we've got a lot of medical knowledge in medical plants and resources. Unfortunately, these people with that knowledge are not literate. How do we do something about this and get access to that information, make it accessible literally, so that many people can get access to it? I imagine there are people in the audience who have very strong, um, be better suggestions than I do about this, but I think the solution has to be a local solution, one that comes from um, an African perspective and that somehow is, is helped from an African perspective. And that's to a certain extent what our summit was trying to look at, is, is how can those, um, uh, those sort of ideas and um, possibilities be supported within Africa, but not um, stopped from being supported through the, the economic problems that they might have. So I, I think there's someone here who had a comment on that. But uh, um, If I could comment, um, Wikipedia is doing a project on citation of oral sources. They felt that Wikipedia was far too North centric in insisting on written um, criteria for inclusion. So, Achar Prabhala in India is one of the people working on it. He has worked with um, African traditional healers and um, 
other, other African participants. So I think we need to watch that space because clearly what's available um, for those kinds of resources is video. And then the academic community needs to get together to make sure that we have um, the capacity to make those credible articles or credible inputs that can actually be incorporated into the journal literature. Or any literature, sorry. No, I'm experts of trying to publish in um, Biomed Central. I noticed that you listed countries that receive an automatic waiver, and South Africa is not listed in those countries because we consider to be uh, towards the middle being a middle income country. But my concern is within South Africa, we are a highly divided you know, uh, society, so that we try now to empower black scientists. And usually they do not have enough funding to be able to fund article processing fees. And therefore, we are disadvantaged because we do not qualify for the automatic um, debate. So we cannot publish in open access journals where we expect it to pay article processing fees. So I would like to hear what your comment um, is on countries like South Africa, where, yes, it is true, some people can afford, but there is a section of the society that cannot afford, and those are the people that we try to get to be published. So my concern from that scenario is that we end up with um, journals like the open access um, journals, having only those people who can afford publishing, and therefore it biases the kind of information that gets into the scientific world. So um, we are committed that people are not stopped from publishing because of their funds. So as well as the automatic waivers, we also have um, discretionary waivers, which means that if someone is not from a waiver country but does not have the funds, we um, have the option that they can request a waiver and then um, it's, it's looked at whether they, they have the funds or not. And we have um, a very large majority of those requested waivers are also granted. So when um, an author submits to our journals not from a waiver country, we are um, very willing to consider a request for a waiver if they don't have the funds to publish. Um, and, and we would encourage any authors to do that if, if they feel they don't have the funding to, to publish.